so um, uh, what I will be talking to you today about is um, how can we use game theory uh, in order to uh, understand if uh, we can find some uh, universal constraints to uh, the probability of life. Uh, why game theory? So uh, game theory, um, probably many of you already know, uh, studies strategic interactions between some interacting entities, right? Uh, these were originally economic interactions, um, uh, and um, usually game theory deals with um, phenomena of comp cooperation versus competition, so that kind of behavior, uh, and you probably heard about zero-sum games and prisoner's dilemma, some of these uh, famous uh, games. Uh, the first general mathematical formulation was done by John von Neumann and Oskar Morgenstern in uh, 1944, and it has been widely used in economics, in social sciences, in biology. Um, and the gist of using game theory is that the actions are usually informed by expectations and interactions, and they can be applied to uh, pretty much any uh, uh, life forms that, uh, that we can think of. Um, one example that is interesting with respect to game theory, and I chose this example because often and, uh, we get this analogy about, you know, meeting um, uh, an extraterrestrial civilization, whether it's going to be like, you know, when uh, the uh, Spanish conquistadors landed in uh, America. Uh, which is a very rough analogy, but uh, in, in the context of game theory, um, uh, Cortes actually, when he did land in Veracruz, he burned his ship. So what does it mean? So uh, the game theoretic decision here is not that uh, he left no option to his soldiers because they burned their ships, but it was about the message that they sent to the Aztecs into the new world. So any commander who could be so confident as to will willfully destroy his own option to be prudent, if the battle went bad for him, must have good reasons for such extreme optimism, right? So that was the message that was being sent. So it cannot be wise to attack an opponent who has a good reason, whatever exactly that one might be, for being sure that he, uh, that he can't lose. Um, so how does this play in, in this idea of cooperation and competition in biological systems? Uh, with this, in these examples, the soldiers were not motivated only by uh, self-interest, basically to run away in battle. They were also motivated by what other soldiers do and what they expect others to do. So that is uh, collective behavior. Um, and even a quite brave soldier may prefer to run rather than heroically by but pointlessly die trying to stem the oncoming tidal by himself. And the retreat is not only made physically impossible, but also economically impossible. So if we are th thinking in terms of game theory, the cost of the retreat is at least equal or higher than the cost of fighting, which is the cost of fighting being equal to death. So how does this relate to uh, biological systems in, in general? Um, Let's take another example about zero sums and non zero sums game. In nature or in social systems, we rarely find zero sums game, right? Uh, because zero sum is, is usually a fallacy. One does not gain what the other loses, or vice versa. So we actually never find this in nature. Uh, but non zero sum games allow for individual competition and cooperation within the system to lead to some emergent pr patterns and properties at the system's level. And the classic example of prisoner's dilemma it shows us that rational behavior usually leads to socially and beneficial outcome because usually the, um, in, in the prisoner's dilemma, both, uh, the, uh, uh, both prisoners will settle for uh, defection, so for what we call the uh, sub dash equilibrium instead of actually uh, cooperating with each other. But that's a just one game. When we are talking about game theory, we can also uh, think about, uh, about it dynamically, so in terms of evolution, so in terms of the evolutionary game theory. And evolutionary game theory originated as an application of the mathematical theory of games to biological context. And it has been arising from the realization that the frequency dependent fitness introduces a very strategic aspect to evolution in general. So evolution treated by evolutionary game theory does not need to be a biological evolution. Often it can also be understood as a cultural evolution where this refers to changes in beliefs and norms over time and subsequently to technological evolution as well.
So the rationality assumptions underlying evolutionary game theory are in many cases more appropriate for the modeling of social systems and technological systems than those assumptions underlying the very traditional theory of games as I showed the first one with respect to the prisoner's dilemma. And this is, was first developed by uh, Fisher in the genetic theory of natural selection in his attempt to explain the approximate equality of the sex ratio in, in mammals. So there are extinction risks that are based based on fitness. And why is that that the sex ratio is approximately equal in many species where the majority of the males never mate? So in this species, the non-mating males would seem to be excess baggage carried around by the rest of the population without having uh, any real use. So Fisher realized that if we measure individual fitness in terms of the expected number of grandchildren, then individual fitness depends on the distribution of the males and the females in the population. When there is a greater number of females in the population, the males have a higher individual fitness. When there are more males in the population, females have a higher individual fitness. And the fact that individual fitness depends upon the relative frequency of males and females in the population introduces a strategic element into evolution. So where does this lead us? It leads us to um, an evolutionary game. And if we take, for example, the evolutionary prisoner's dilemma, uh, we can think of um, any uh, biological system, uh, any living system as having multiple players with multiple rounds. And basically from uh, an original game where um, the, um, where the opponents would uh, defect and would basically compete against each other, we actually, from starting, starting from there, we actually observe the evolution of cooperation. And this is an example of a um, simulation where you can see, for example, if the red patches here are um, defectors and the blue patches are cooperators, we can think of different ways in which we can start with different um, scenarios of different populations. Um, where we can have more defectors or more cooperators and based, based on the defection award, uh, we can see whether uh, this system leads to equilibrium or not. And systems that lead to equilibrium are dead sy systems, right? These kind of systems, they don't evolve. Systems that lead to non-stationarity to non-equilibrium are systems that, uh, keep, um, uh, that keep, on, uh, keep on evolving. So some observations that we can draw from a genetic evolutionary prisoner's dilemma is that there are few assumptions about the initial conditions and all initial conditions can be explored, right? So we can explore a very wide range of initial conditions with respect to uh, uh, the population and the, uh, and the uh, defection awards. Um, there are very specific ranges of cooperation and defection awards that allow for the system to evolve. And most parametric combinations lead to stationarity, which means extinction. So from these, we can actually isolate only those parameters that lead to non-stationarity or to a system that keeps on evolving. Um, and we can look at this in a more specific way so we can inform these kind of computational models, not in, so we can play with them in the abstract, that's nice and fine, but what's interesting is that we can actually inform them with some, um, uh, with uh, the values that uh, we get from laboratory experiments. So if we take the example of viruses, um, and uh, we use the findings from this paper, Evolutionarily Stable Equilibrium and Extraterrestrial uh, Interactions, um, we can see that natural selection can function as a player by selecting different behaviors and different genotypes. So the stability of an equilibrium strategy can be tested by introducing a small mutant or an invading or defecting population. And if mutants are less fit than those that are playing the equilibrium strategy, then the equilibrium is an evolutionarily stable uh, strategy. And the most important thing what, when we can think about applying game theory is that human-like cognition is not necessary for game theory. So that's why we can have virus-virus games and we can apply this for um, artificial um, artificial type, uh, artificial type of, um, uh, let's say, entities. So uh, if we are looking at an agent based model of natural selection and cooperation, <clears throat> we can look at uh, whether the virus strategies are chosen through natural selection, 
When multiple viruses compete for the same resource, for the same cell, they may exhibit one of the two phenotypes. So one of them cooperates by manufacturing the abundant product. The second one, they defect by making some product and using a lot of the products that another virus has made, right? So there is this constant interplay of cooperation and defection between the viruses. And the fitness levels are estimated experimentally using uh, the data from Turner and Chao, and we normalized that to one. So if we this would be the payoff matrix that we use for the virus prisoners uh, dilemma uh, with different phenotypes with uh, phi six and phi H two, and uh, the empirically derived fitness payoffs uh, imply that viruses phi uh, face um, uh, the same the same dile uh, prisoners dilemma again with a Nash equilibrium, right? So they settle in uh, the sub Nash equilibrium. The defector strategy that is employed by um, phi, uh, H2 provides an advantage over the phi 6 strategy during the co-infection regardless of the other virus strategy. So just in a nutshell, uh, the phi uh, H2 strategy strictly dominates the other strategy and this allows for the H2 strategy to, for the phi H2 to invade the population of phi 6. And this is how basically uh, we can see um, how uh, the fitness of the environment in, uh, in this type of population uh, is evolving. So I'm going to go a little bit faster over this because if we're putting this information in an evolutionary setting and we set the defection award to 0.83, the subnash equilibrium that was found in laboratory experiments, and we set an initial cooperation of a random chance of just 50-50% with respect to the population of cooperation versus competition, uh, we can see actually that the, uh, that the population becomes extinct almost immediately. So a better alternative in which we uh, did this simulation is to explore all the parameter ranges for the initial cooperation we allow for three types of defection awards and the relative defection awards when the other defects when you cooperate. And we observe when the system does not lead to equilibrium or leads to the equilibrium over a very long time. And some observations from these um, simulation experiments is that the subnash equilibrium that is classic in prisoner's dilemma always leads to extinction. The high defect payoff when the two populations play different strategies leads to island of survival from one population within the mass of the other population. And there are increasing initial cooperation ratio and that the increasing initial cooperation ratio leads to more islands, but not to longer survival, right? So we can do all these um, uh, experiments in an artificial setting. And we can also look at uh, low initial cooperation versus high initial cooperation and how uh, these can lead again to these islands of non-stationarity or non-equilibrium, right? So we can let these systems to run and run and run and they will never settle and they will keep on evolving. So uh, what we noticed is that this relative defection payoff leads to non-equilibrium uh, in the system. At Blue Marble Space Institute, uh, we, in the YSP program, the um, uh, program that is hiring interns over the summer. I've been working this summer on experiments with a couple of uh, uh, two brilliant undergraduate uh, undergrads um, where we wanted basically to reproduce artificially the behavior of these constantly evolving systems. So we look not just on how the systems evolve based on uh, how they influence each other's cooperation or defection, but we also looked at whether this, uh, this system moves, right? So we introduced movement into the system versus, so if before we looked only at the rules of uh, the game, now we introduce some more parameters. So we are looking also at different movement ranges. And we also looked at, are starting to look at other games. So, so not just Prisoner's Dilemma, but at, uh, a game of tit for tat, for example. And what we have observed, uh, what kind of experiments can we uh, do with game theory is that what are the differences in the output of non-equilibrating systems based on whether these are different games, so is it Prisoner's Dilemma, Hawk Dog, Tit for Tat, etc., uh, when we maintain all initial conditions uh, constant, right? What's, what's the difference? Also, what are the differences in the output of non-equilibrating systems when we vary the initial conditions? So we have different population ratios, we have a different preferences for cooperating versus non-cooperating, and we have different movement patterns. And can we replicate artificially these experimental results with uh, data from uh, laboratory experiments? So some of our preliminary results show that
that um, within of a full parameter space simulation, uh, in 25% of the cases, will render non-equilibrium behavior. So again, most of them uh, render uh, uh, the system to become extinct. But in 25% of the cases, they don't. So we, we, have, uh, we can observe this constant uh, evolution with, inside the system. And all, what we also observe so far is that all these depend on lower defection awards. So if we have a high defection award, um, in, in this parameter, uh, in this parameter space, then oh, they will lead again to distinction. So there has to be an internal propensity within these um, artificial entities to uh, have a low defection award, so not to be incentivized for for defection for non -co for competition. And the initial population distribution over cooperators and non cooperators actually has no effect on the evolution. So we can start with a large population of competitors and over time using uh, the, game th uh, the evolutionary game theory we see that actually cooperative behavior um, arises and some conclusions we can draw here is that um, cross-disciplinary methods such as evolutionary game theory agent-based models are quite powerful for us to understand the limits of systems of interaction such as living systems um, that can be easily extended into astrobiology and some problems, um, set of problems of, uh, let's say, uh, sustainability of civilizations. And they can explore scenarios that currently do not exist in our reality or understanding of uh, our current, or our current understanding of biology and living systems. And uh, yeah, thank you.